So I'm in uh, the second week of a five-week sermon series, a four- to five-week sermon series, depending on when this baby shows up. Um, We're planning on a five-week sermon series. This is week two. Uh, And the sermon series is based on the parables of Luke, uh, the parables of Jesus according to the Gospel of Luke. And the reason that we're doing that is that's actually lectionary text. We use the lectionary in this service. And these are like four ascribed texts that a whole bunch of different kinds of Christians use. There's an Old Testament, a Psalm, and a Gospel lesson, and an Epistle lesson. And I was just looking through the lectionary and I kind of found this theme. And so I ran with it and I made it into a sermon series. But that also means I didn't necessarily pick the text. And so um, for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the parables of of Jesus according to the Gospel of Luke. And um, Luke is an interesting gospel. The the Jesus of the Gospel of Luke is very prophetic. And what I mean by that is he's, uh, you'll often hear him quote the prophets. And he's also, uh, out of all of the different ways Jesus is represented, the one who's always worried about the least of these, the most vulnerable of society. So, uh, and a parable, right? We all know that word. A parable is a story to just make a point. Um, Sometimes Jesus told a parable because he was asked a question, or sometimes he was just trying to to drive a point home in maybe a nicer way. (laughs) Um, So today we're going to meet Jesus as a very large crowd of people are following him. Emma, can you go ahead? Thanks. For those who are able, please stand out of respect for the gospel. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Okay, so you know, um, like when you're trying to sell someone on an idea, and like not in a malicious way, but like a good way, like you recently visited a very good restaurant, and so now you're going to tell your friend about it, right? You're like, oh my God, the grass-fed beef was amazing, the polenta was off the chain, the service staff was excellent, right? And you kind of go through this, this motion of, of like, you have to try this thing because it's so awesome. And like some people are even brave enough to do this with their church, right? They'll say, you've got to come to my worshiping congregation. I leave on Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, or after my small group that meets on Tuesday night filled. Filled with God, filled with love, ready to deal with my week, you know? It is the most fulfilling thing that that I do every week. It sounds like Jesus is doing the exact opposite of that at the beginning of this text, all right, if you're trying to sell someone on the idea that being a disciple is a wonderful thing to do with your life, he is doing a terrible, terrible job in this text. Okay, he literally says, anyone who does not hate, hate their mother, their father, their spouse, their children, their siblings, cannot follow me. In fact, If you can't give away all of your possessions, you may as well turn around. This is a terrible pitch for discipleship, okay? Who could possibly want to go to become a disciple after they've heard this? Certainly not me, right? It just doesn't really make me want to know Christ in a deeper and more intimate way. 
It sounds like a way to turn someone off from the movement. The invitation is difficult. So I don't really believe that Jesus is someone who's trying to be mean or to scare us. So we're going to go ahead and pick this apart a little bit and see if we can get something else out of the story. So we know that Jesus at this point is being followed by a very large crowd of people. That's how the scripture starts. So instead of assuming that Jesus is trying to scare people away, it may be better for us to assume that he really wants them to understand more about what it may mean for them to be his followers. Like before you continue to walk with me and invest and invest all of this time, I just want you to know. I want you to know ahead of time what, what, could, be, what could be part of your life now. So he tells them the parable. And he says, if you're going to build a tower, right? If you decide that you're going to go into the city and you're going to build a building, okay? You, don't you like first make sure that you can? You make sure you can afford the property, right? That it's in an area where all of your stuff's not going to get like ruined. You make sure that you've got the insurance that you need and all of the contractors lined up. You make sure that you've got all of your equipment. You make sure that you have all of your supplies, you make sure you've got your launch date, right? You make sure you have all of these things. You don't just randomly, like, start building because that's not a very smart idea. Or, or, like, what kind of king would wage war without considering how many soldiers it would take to win in a battle? Would you really be willing to put thousands of lives on the line without thinking that through first as, as a king and as a leader? No one would do that. Jesus is saying, friends, there is a cost to being my disciple. Traveling this road with me is going to be really difficult at times. The title of this sermon is The Cost of Discipleship. The only time the word cost is used in the Gospels is in this text, which begs the question, what is the cost of discipleship? What is the cost of of being a Christian. Now we know that there are countries where it is illegal to be Christian, where if they find you worshiping, you will be sentenced to death or thrown in jail. We know that there are countries where owning a Bible is illegal, right? There, the early church was filled with people who were martyred, martyred for following Jesus, for following this way of life, for choosing nonviolence over, over the state. We know that. But that's a little bit out of our context, right? We live in a country where, I mean, most of us get the big Christian holidays off of work. Most of you get the big Christian holidays off of work. <laughs> I do not get the big Christian holidays off of work, right? Um, and, and like, I, I'm really able to freely worship and celebrate uh, my faith pretty much anywhere. I mean, we have Bible studies that meet at coffee shops and bars and we're all over the place, and no one's coming up and really trying to persecute us, right? So what is, it, what is the cost of discipleship for us in, in this context? And, I, and I'm not just talking about money here, right? We can say, well, the scriptures clearly say a 10% tithe is, is what is expected to us for the cost of discipleship. But, but I'm not talking about that. I don't think Jesus is either, um, you know, he even goes as far to say we have to be willing to give up all of our possessions. But what do we really possess, right? We possess way more than finances and physical objects. In fact, those are usually the last things that I'm afraid of giving up. Um, we possess our feelings. I have a sense of security that is very important to me. I feel very safe in my home and in my neighborhood. I don't worry about gun violence where I live. I don't, I don't worry about bombs being dropped on my family. I have a sense of security and I possess that greatly. I have a sense of pride, which is terrible at most times, right? But I possess that sense of pride. I, that's me, I gotta own that. Um, I possess a title at my work, right? Reverend. That matters. People put stock in that. Some of you have jobs. Um, even if you're just, even if you're a parent, I say just a parent, hardest thing I've ever done. 
The title mother or father, the title grandmother or grandfather, sister, brother, these titles that we possess, they matter to us. They define us, right? We possess all of these feelings. We possess a sense of ownership over over certain objects and, and, uh, and roles in our lives. Some of us even possess a sense of patriotism, right? And, and that our country matters and our pride in our country matters. Being a disciple may mean that some of the things that we kind of hide behind, some of those possessions, may be taken from us. In fact, they will be challenged. They'll be pushed against. And we may be left in a state of vulnerability. Now, that is a scary word for people who really understand what vulnerability means when all of that other stuff is stripped away and it is just you. And you are open. You are open to ridicule. You are open to harm. You are open to heartbreak. Vulnerability is one of the most difficult places to be. You know, we hear Jesus say things like, love your enemy. That is a vulnerable space. If you can truly sit in that space, that is a vulnerable space to sit. So when my husband and I first met, this is a super cute story. When my husband and I first met, we were working at this punk rock club called the Creepy Crawl. Some of you may have remembered it. Um, And all of the other employees were like his best friends. It was like only staffed by men. I was one of three women that ever worked there ever in like its 15 year reign of punk rock greatness. And um, so all of, so him and all of his roommates, his three other roommates, worked at this place as well. And they lived in this, like, punk rock equivalent of a squat house on the south side. I think, at best, they had one clean towel among them. Okay, it was, it was like that. Um, anyway, I was trying to flirt with this guy, and he was totally oblivious for months months. I'm like scratching and clawing to try to get his attention. And I'm, and I'm really nice to like all the guys that work there and they're not really used to that and they don't know how to handle that. And um, we ended up not dating until about like six months after we met because he was so oblivious. Um, <laughs> but once things started getting serious, once things started getting serious, I asked him why it took so long to show interest. And he said that when he first met me, that he and his friends just had this like not so appealing view of me. And I asked him what it was even though I knew the answer. I knew the answer, but I wanted to see if he'd be honest with me. I wanted to hear him say it. And he said, we all just thought you were trying too hard. And he said this because I was so friendly and so giving and so caring to him and his friends and he had never really seen that. And uh, I was like, you are completely, 100%, totally right. I do try. I try so much, it comes off as if it's fake. It comes off as if I'm insecure. I try so hard. I try so hard because I am under the crazy impression that people are actually worth it. That people are actually worth it. That putting ourselves out there and trying to figure out how to love other people is worth all of the junk that comes with it, even the way that they'll perceive me. Because at first they see that, but eventually they learn that that's truly who I am. People are actually worth me giving my real and true care to them. I'm going to tell you something. Being that vulnerable in my life toward other people has caused me immense amounts of pain. It is a painful place to be often. It's like, um, like the first time you tell someone that you're in love with them, right? You don't know if they're going to say it back. You just, you just put yourself out there and you're all open and vulnerable and you just kind of risk everything. <laughs> the ridicule and the rejection. Um, you know, it's, it's not a safe place to be by any means. Because when you give that kind of love to others or to the world, that chance of being rejected is so real. And the rejection 
It leaves scars and bumps and bruises on our souls and sometimes even in our bodies. We can feel it in the pit of our stomach weeks later. But in the same breath, almost every scar, bump, and bruise I have earned or collected has been worth the opportunity to really love people well, to to really give myself to them, to really give my heart to God and to her people and to her creation. It has been worth it. Difficult, yes. Costly, of course, but worth it. It's not easy. Loving my parents, that's easy. Even when I didn't like them, right? Loving them was easy. Same with my siblings. They could drive me crazy. But there was something that connected us, and it was always easy to love them. I know that's not true for all families. I'm aware of that, and I want to acknowledge that. But for the majority of us, it's pretty easy to love our families. We're bound together. But loving the world and the people that praise power and authority over serving and compassion, now that's hard. That is really hard. Crossing the aisle to meet people where they are And searching for a way to see them with the same kind of love that Jesus would, that is costly. This is something that I work on. I find people that I totally disagree with on stuff, and I try to see in them the same level of awesomeness that I see in the people that it's easy to agree with, right? But that's not easy. It takes practice, and it hurts often because you put yourself out there, and they just kind of make fun of you or reject you. And you don't really know how to handle it. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that um, I expect you all to leave here today and to love everybody that you meet or that you will not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to make that very clear, okay? None of us, none of us has have that, none of us has that in us. Not yet at least. What I am saying is that following Jesus takes us to a place that makes us uncomfortable, that makes us vulnerable, that kind of finds our boundaries and gently pushes on them, or sometimes radically pushes on them, until we open up just a bit more. I've always kind of thought of it as like an ocean wave that depending on how severe the storm is, just kind of carves out a space in a rock and just makes a little bit more room and a little bit more room for those waters to come into, right? We have a lot to talk about with water today, about what our discipleship means and how these waters are the continuation of that, the beginning of that and the continuation of that, and how it's these waters that will slowly push against our lives as we figure out what this discipleship means to us and to the children that we nurture in this church. Forgiving people who harm us. Choosing peace over violence. Seeing those people as our people. These are not easy mandates to live by. Figuring out how to get along with the boss that has harmed you. Figuring out how to get along with the person who has broken your heart or your trust. This is not easy. Figuring out how to have a sense of security after you've allowed yourself to be vulnerable. These are not easy things. But I believe that they are worth it. I really do. I also believe, I truly believe that there will be times when we are on the other side of that compassion. Okay, when it's not your turn to try to be the one to give compassion, but where you will receive it. You will receive the blessing and the vulnerability and the care from some unexpected source. And it's in those times that I think that we may begin to really understand what Jesus meant about the cost of discipleship. That when we feel our most unworthy, someone will remind us of our worth, that we are really worthy of God's love. And it's never the person you expect. It's never the person you expect. It's often the person that you pass judgment on. It's gonna be the person that you're looking down on, and then they're the one who gives you grace. Someone will say to you, I actually believe that you're worth it. Here, let me be this thing for you. Let me be open for you. 
And we will witness the hands and feet and life of Christ reaching out to us through another person that we never expected it from. One of my favorite Christian authors, Nadia Bowles Weber, says it like this. Being part of Christ's bizarre kingdom looks more like being thirsty and having someone you don't even like give you water than it looks like polishing your own crown. Yeah. We will receive compassion from unexpected sources. We will be saved by those we are the least comfortable with. And this will change us radically. And it will open our hearts in new ways that we never expected. I read this parable, and it's very high-sounding mandates. And they're true, but I'm not saying we all have to become monks, okay? I am saying that our boundaries and our limits of compassion will be tested, and we will be pulled in ways that will change us radically. And at times, our hearts will be torn open, and our lives will be changed forever. And that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ, There is a cost to that. There is a cost to that in our souls, and we can feel it. And I think that that's what this parable is about. That Jesus was saying that we need to be honest with ourselves about the change that we will endure in our discipleship. There is a cost to following Jesus, that things won't stay the same, and that you too will be opened up. Amen.